I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Gautam Basu Thakur, a critical theorist working in the fields of comparative cultural studies, post-coloniality, and globalization. He is interested in theoretical psychoanalysis and its interventions in post-colonial studies. His books include Post-Colonial Theory and Avatar, Lacan and the Non-Human, Reading Lacan's Seminar 8 on Transference, and Post-Colonial Lack, Identity, Culture, Surplus. He's the director of critical theory at Boise State University and the recipient of the Faculty Excellence Award in the College of Arts and Sciences. He's also contributed a chapter to the new book, Lacan and Race, edited by Derek Hook and Sheldon George. Links to his work can be found in the text accompanying this episode. As with all Rendering Unconscious podcast episodes, there is a video accompanying this episode at YouTube. Just visit Trapart Films' YouTube channel. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T Film at YouTube. Or search for Rendering Unconscious podcast. Rendering Unconscious is also a book, Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry, from Trapart Books 2019. For more information, you can visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast at our Patreon patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. That's V-A-N-E-S-S-A 23 C-A-R-L. Your support is very appreciated. Thank you so much for supporting Rendering Unconscious Podcast and all of my other creative endeavors. Well, I was thinking uh, maybe start with a little bit of my background, which can explain what I do and why I'm interested in the areas of my research, uh, which are post-colonial studies and psychoanalysis, uh, not areas that are habitually thought to be compatible partners. So I guess a little bit of my background can help explain how I came to these areas. So uh, what I love telling my close friends is that uh, I have had a education like Tiresias. I have education in both canonical British literature from India and then comparative literature after I moved to the United States. And the other thing that I believe, uh, the reason I wanted to talk about my my, uh, background is people often think, that I studied post-colonial in India and psychoanalysis in the United States, but it's actually the reverse. Oh, wow. uh, so uh, I went to a reputed university. Uh, I was an English major or English honor student, and I did my bachelor's, master's, and MPhil uh, in English literature. Uh, interestingly, uh, I did not get any exposure to post-colonial theory or studies. Uh, There was, if I can remember correctly, nothing in the undergraduate curriculum. And there could have been a few texts at the master's level, but the kind of formal orientation one gets into an area of study, I did not get that uh, 
when speaking about post-colonial studies in India. But there wasn't any formal courses on Freud or psychoanalysis either. But I did study uh, Freud and psychoanalysis uh, unofficially with a university professor uh, who is still a university professor and he is India's first uh, Lacanian analyst in practice. Uh, so I, I went to him because I was interested in knowing more about the mind and how it works. And I was like a um, freshman student. And I said, well, I want to study uh, Freud with you because people say you have studied Freud. And he said, yeah, sure, we can do this unofficially, but you need to go and come back after you've read Freud. So I said, fine, I'll go and read Freud. And I went to the library and they said, well, there are 24 volumes. So which one do you want to read? So I went back and said, uh, where do you want me to start? Which one should I read? So he said, all of them. So I read, I think I read all of them except for the last one. And I went back to him and I said, well, I'm ready now. And he said, well, there's one more thing you need to do before we can start, which is reread all of them. Wow. So that's how I got introduced into to Freud and to psychoanalysis. And I have friends uh, who first read Lacan and then Freud or first read Zizek and then Lacan and then Freud. But for me, it was the almost the other way around. So I read Freud and then at the master's level, there was one special paper on literature and psychoanalysis. That was the only official thing where I read Freud and some Lacan and uh, that's where it all started. Uh, and after I moved to the United States and I made a deliberate decision of not going into an English department, but uh, enrolling in a comparative literature program because I wanted to expand my horizons beyond canonical British literature, uh, I got more exposure to psychoanalysis, but I also got some of my first formal classes in post-colonial studies. So that's how I got interested in these two disciplines or areas and this is something that's in my in my recent book as well post-colonial lack uh, i i wanted to think about what are the possible relationships uh, disciplinary relationships that can be forged or that existed and needs to be um, you know returned between post-colonial studies uh, and psychoanalysis. Uh, so that's kind of the way I, you know, arrived at my uh, areas of interest, uh, post-colonial and psychoanalysis. And uh, those areas or their relationship is also what I try to examine and explore uh, through my uh, book, Post-Colonial Lack. Um, which came out last year, just when everything was shutting down in March. So not a good timing, but that's how it was. Yeah, well, we'll talk about it now. It's a, a fantastic title. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I thought about, you know, uh, I mean, one reason why it's post-colonial lack, I think I, I mentioned that, I think in my um, acknowledgement of something, that's because uh, the book was conceived between two LAC conferences. So we have a conference here, the LAC, L-A-C-K. So I conceived the book between those two conferences. But also I was in the book, or the way I started off was trying to think about what is lacking in post-colonial studies at the present. And I wanted to address that. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, and lacking in the sense of the relationship between post-colonial and psychoanalysis. Um, and I thought what is really lacking, which I try to argue in the book, is a robust engagement between the two disciplines. Because what exists between the two uh, mostly, and I'm not trying to kind of generalize, but mostly is a kind of uh, mutual indifference. So post-colonial folk would be like, yeah, psychoanalysis, you and your you know, universalizing Oedipus complexes. This is not going to work for us. And then psychoanalytic folk would be like, oh, post-colonial studies, you and your identity politics, it's not going to work for us. But, so I thought if you can bring them together and reimagine the dialogue, uh, that would be beneficial for both fields. 
making psychoanalysis more global and post-colonial theory more rigorously psychoanalytic in its explorations of you know, the conditions of coloniality and post-coloniality. Yeah, because it seems like the kind of marriage or the working with both could be so fruitful. And from the people I know that are working with both, I mean, that's all the work I'm reading lately. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's a very interesting area. I'm, I'm, I'm like, because of course I'm right now invested in exploring this area. So I have been finding it very uh, rich, uh, very stimulating. Um, and, you know, I, uh, the best thing about the book, I don't know uh, whether people like it or not, but I really enjoyed writing it. I really uh, loved working on it. Uh, it was during my sabbatical uh, in the spring of 2018. That's when it started. And uh, I, 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 I think that was a sabbatical well spent. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe you could talk about that time. But I love the lab conferences and the whole, the whole crew. Um, and I know the most recent one, I think it had to be canceled because of the, because of COVID. Um, but maybe you could talk about those conferences and, and coming up with this idea in between and what that was like. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I love uh, the LAC conference and I love the people who go there, not just the organizers, but everyone who, who go there. So um, if I... Uh, remember correctly, I think, uh, what is the first chapter in the book was actually a paper, a 15 minute or 20 minute paper that I had uh, delivered at one of the LAC conferences. And I, I did not, going in, the book was not there. It was just a paper I had written. I wanted to go to this conference and um, I, I, was teaching um, Gayatri Spivak uh, and um, in, in my graduate class. So the paper came out of that uh, where I basically uh, looked at the popularized in post-colonial theory. And it's, it's connections to the um, notion of negativity. Um, so that was the paper. And I was quite surprised that, uh, you know, uh, people uh, responded the way people responded to that paper. I, uh, I got excellent questions and, you know, uh, <clears throat> so that got me thinking like, well, uh, how can I expand this uh, paper maybe into a monograph or something? Uh, then uh, I think uh, it was a year after uh, uh, that I went there and I was presenting a completely different paper, uh, this time on uh, work of creative nonfiction by uh, the American journalist, Catherine Boo. And uh, it was a book about uh, her visit to Mumbai in India. And it was about a slum and the inequalities that are very stark in globalized India on the one hand, you have oh, some of the richest uh, people in the country living there and very next to them would be these uh, slums with some of the poorest living there. So it was a work of uh, creative nonfiction, a journalistic account, basically looking at the inequal development of, of India in the globalized era. And uh, I presented there a paper basically um, noting that the habitual post-colonial analysis of a writer like Catherine Boo and her representation of India, uh, these tend to miss out on some of the issues that contemporary writers from the West, when writing about the East, some of the issues they face or they encounter for which they fail to be ethically committed to their writing. So in other words, what I was trying to uh, say in that, uh, and this later became one of the chapters as well in the book, uh, what I was wanting to say is like, uh, the very common notion of political correctness has become such a big issue along with identity politics 
that writers like Bu cannot ethically talk about the non-West. And I compared her writing with some of the, uh, some vernacular writers. So uh, I'm from the Eastern part of the country. I was born and raised in Calcutta. Uh, and uh, uh, my language is, because there's so many languages in India, like 22 official <laughs> languages, there's no national language. So my language is Bengali. And uh, I, I looked into Bengali writers and how they were representing poverty and people in poverty. And uh, I, I argued that, uh, you know, the only form of ethical representation that can come from someone who lives in the city, someone who is middle class, someone who has reaped the benefits of, let's say, either the previous colonial regime or the current globalized India's munificence, their ethical representation cannot be politically correct. Uh, and these writers, these vernacular writers, unlike Catherine Boo, were uh, both uh, shocked at sites of poverty, but they were also disgusted mm. with, about poverty. And the argument I tried to present there was that for Boo, uh, a white writer from the United States, carrying the baggage of post-coloniality, it almost becomes impossible to make ethical connection with what she is witnessing and then write about it. Um, and this kind of is, again, as I said, one of the chapters in the book, uh, because I wanted to look at how, if we, when we are examining uh, current cultural texts, contemporary cultural texts, and how they represent the non-West, um, we have to take into consideration also uh, what are those um, reasons or issues for which uh, you know a more um, honest representation is is getting stifled. Um, so um, I believe a simple postcolonial analysis of uh, you know othering uh, is that works for, let's say, the 19th century texts uh, does not work today. Uh, so another chapter in the book, I use uh, the example of uh, two films. They do, did not come out at the same time. Uh, one is Black Panther, and the other is Grand Torino by Clint Eastwood. So Black Panther is obviously celebrated for, you know, as a great post-colonial piece, so to speak, right? Uh, it's got all the elements of writing back and taking back control over your history and your destiny and all that stuff. And by contrast, I don't know if you've seen Grand Torino by Clint Eastwood. Mm -mm. Uh, so uh, it's, it's kind of um, heavily criticized for being a very racist film for dealing in stereotypes. Uh, so in that film, Clint Eastwood is a veteran who is uh, living in a part of the city that's rapidly changing. Um, uh, um, and uh, how he does not go along with his Hmong neighbors. Um, and uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, racial slurs and this and that. So two very different kinds of films. And... Uh, most commonly, that's how we will read them. But what I wanted to show in that book is also, or, or show in the chapter is also that uh, if we really um, look closely at Black Panther, um, and this is not my phrase, it's by someone else, um, it is actually Hollywood with a black face. Uh, because the themes, tropes, and ideas that are present there, uh, these are all typical Hollywood themes, tropes, and ideas, except we have Black actors in there. And the individual who could have really done something for emancipation of the oppressed across the world is the cousin who actually is villainized and killed off at the end. And uh, celebrating the 
Black Panther over the uh, Challenger is, uh, again, very symptomatic of our neoliberal cultural worldview about uh, gradual reform, but not the cut of the change, the immediate cut that is required to bring about a change. So I, I, I have felt, again, I, I am not saying this is, this is the general picture of post-colonial studies or cultural studies, analysis of culture, but I, I have felt that the usual practices of examination, examination and analysis of cultural texts as pursued from the disciplinary um, side of post-colonial studies uh, is not adequate for the global present to really unpack the myriad ways in which uh, the, the conditions of coloniality continue, representationally speaking and materially speaking, how the conditions of coloniality uh, continue to work its way through our current age and time. That's fascinating. And could you talk a little bit more about post-colonial studies? Like, because everyone I've read, my, my degree is, I'm a PsyD, so I have like a clinically psychology degree, clinical psychology degree. So my graduate school was just basically training me to work in hospitals, learn all the medications, learn CBT and relaxation exercises and things like that, like very medical model. And so everything I've learned since then, like with psychoanalysis was all postgraduate school. And there, I haven't really had any like formal classes or anything like that in post-colonial studies. Um, and I was just wondering like what that, all everyone I've read that talks about it are all also analysts. So it's bridged together already. So I'm just wondering like what it's like without the psychoanalysis, like what does post-colonial studies look like? Well, uh, so let's, let's start with the word. I mean, the word post. Um, so the first thing to keep in mind, what does it mean? Does it mean after? Is it a suffix that is a signature of temporality? So after decolonization, everything that is happening uh, or does post or should we understand post in um, terms of an ideology, something that is against colonialism or uh, the colonial regime. Uh, both are actually uh, valid ways of, or for understanding what post-colonialism means. It can be the study of uh, cultures and societies after they have moved out of the colonial regime. Uh, in case of uh, my country, India, it would be 1947. So everything after 1947 um, would be post-colonial. And therefore, the one of the things or a couple of things that a post-colonial uh, academic can do is to look at this period after 47, after independence, uh, look at texts and look at the uh, new society to see how it is different from or how it continues the previous colonial era. Right. Um, if we look at or think of post in post-colonial in terms of ideological or something that is anti-colonial, then of course we are not bound or restricted by the temporal cut of decolonization. We can also look at texts that were written during the colonial period, but which were um, very much critical of the colonial regime. Um, now, chances are they will not be critical on the surface because then they would be banned or censored or something like that. So then the exercise can become looking at how the critique of the colonial regime has been veiled or cloaked through metaphor or you know, through a kind of a, a fable type writing or something like that. Now, these are not the only things that post-colonial academics do. Uh, there are a range of areas in which they are interested, uh, including psychoanalysis as clinical practice. 
because psychoanalysis, and this, this is something that uh, not many people know, or possibly they do, uh, the Indian, the IPA, the International Psychoanalytic Associations chapter in India opened, I think, either in 1921 or 22, but it started before the French chapter opened. Okay. Um, and uh, the, one of the founders, or in fact, the main person, uh, the founder, uh, he had a long correspondence with Freud. His, his name was Girindra Shekhar Bose. But where post-colonialists often become interested is, and Christian Hartnack has an excellent book on the history of psychoanalysis in India. And uh, the interesting thing is the discipline was introduced in order to serve the empire. Mm. So British psychoanalysts practicing in India or colonial India would write about the mind of the Hindu mm. or the mind of the Muslim Indian, which would always be presented as problematic or symptomatic or neurotic, therefore less than the mind of the Europeans and thus justifying the colonial regime. Now, obviously things changed after, after decolonization and stuff like that, but that is also a very, very interesting area of study for post-colonialists, which would be how disciplines um, were introduced in the colonies in order to sustain the rule of the empire. Uh, like psychoanalysis, it, it, psychoanalysis started later, I mean, in the 20th century, but English literature. Uh, one of the, again, uh, uh, I often tell my students that uh, this English literature as a discipline uh, did not start in Harvard or Yale, Oxford or Cambridge. It started at Fort William College in Calcutta in 1817. And in 1835, uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay, an English lawman, famously presented what is known as the Minute on Indian Education. It's basically a bill that was sent to the parliament and it was passed, which said the British government should spend money on English education in India and not the vernaculars. Why? And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's a very famous a uh, couple of lines from that bill, because, and this is Macaulay writing the bill, so it's Macaulay speaking, we want to create a breed of Indians who are English in taste and culture, mm. but Indian by blood and color. And this would be the group, uh, intermediary breed or, or you know, uh, hybridized, group of people who would be working between the masses and the British ruling class. Mm. Um, so by the mid 19th century, I mean, English literature was very uh, well placed in, in Indian universities, but with some interesting omissions. For instance, while Shakespeare was being taught, Wordsworth was being taught, Coleridge was being taught, Percy Shelley was not being taught mm. because Percy Shelley was considered a kind of a revolutionary writer, a writer who would rile up the masses and therefore it cannot be taught to the Indians. So it's actually a very, very broad and interesting field, uh, post-colonial studies. It kind of, um, many say it started with Edward Said's 1978 book, Orientalism. Uh, then it really became big in the United States uh, with uh, Gayatri Spivak, with Homi Bhabha, uh, and Said Spivak and Bhabha are often uh, called the Holy Trinity of the field. Um, I personally though think that uh, alongside Said's 1978 book, the book that should be also considered as marking the beginnings of post-colonial studies, is Richard Gross Richards' Sultan's Court. And I mention it because um, people interested in psychoanalysis would find it of great interest because Gross Richard looks at 18th century, uses Lacan without ever mentioning Lacan, 
And his basic uh, uh, topic of study is the gaze and the harem and how it kind of uh, creates the 18th century French response to the East and these ideas about the East's illicit enjoyments, like their excessive sexuality, their sexual prowess. Um, and it's, so his, his archive is the French one. So it's looking at uh, Turkey, Ottoman Turkish uh, empire and their relation to the French imaginary. So that's another marvelous book. So, you know, I often say that from the very beginnings of post-colonial studies, there is psychoanalysis because there is gross research. Um, others like Baba have used French theory, uh, including Lacan and Derrida. Um, and in one of the things I try to do or say in my book, um, rather provocatively, is that Gayatri Spivak is uh, one of the most refreshing readers of Freud, um, just that she doesn't say so, and we often don't read her that way. But yeah, I mean, uh, postcolonial studies is um, yeah. I, I know I know I should be articulating it better because I teach it um, to my students. But it's a really uh, big and robust field, um, and uh, you know. Uh, so those are just like the top of the iceberg, tip of the iceberg for what it is and what it tries to do. I think you articulated that very well. <laughs> Um, no, when I was last, last summer, or last May, when the pandemic was first starting, um, uh, there was a conference on the psychology of global crises that I spoke at. Uh, and it was, you know, had people from all over the world. And at the end, they had like all the speakers who were like talking to each other about how it went and like kind of throwing ideas around. And some, someone who had presented who was in India, actually, she said, I just think that we're too stuck on post-colonialism and we need to move on. And being from the United States originally, I was thinking, no, definitely not. We need much more of this because I, I hadn't heard about it until, you know, just a couple of years ago, um, not being, you know, not being taught it in academia. And I think a lot of people are not taught it in academia, um, even if they are in graduate programs. So I think it definitely needs to continue to be taught more and more. But what you heard, I mean, there is a, there is a fatigue for sure. And there has been also in the first uh, decade and a half uh, of this 21st century, a lot of discussion, especially in the United States where post-colonial is really big, uh, regarding the death of the discipline, the death of post-colonial studies. So at some of our big conferences like Modern Languages Association and the American Comparative Literature Association, there have been panels uh, basically saying, what's next? Where do we move now? Uh, because the idea was that with the 21st century, we, are, we have moved, at least in the United States, into a more robust multicultural society. The idea was, uh, well, at least the hope was then, this is also a post-racial society. Uh, race no longer matters. So what's the relevance of post-colonial? Uh, many formerly colonized countries who are now post-colonial, uh, they have also, ended up replicating the uh, systems of the colonial regime when treating the minorities within their national boundaries. So the discipline during that time was being questioned. Uh, and there were a lot of talk about, let's move forward. I think between 2016 and 2020, at least in the United States for obvious reasons, uh, that got a bit tempered because we have seen the BLM and other stuff. So we know that you know, this uh, multicultural society based on tolerant pluralism, love your neighbor, we are all very happy together is just a facade. It's not the real thing that's happening. Um, but the fatigue nonetheless remains at least for me because 
as I've said in the book, and again, this is not everyone in postcolonial studies, but I, I have felt in my experience of you know, attending conferences, listening to papers, reading postcolonial scholarship, that the discipline was restricted by the need for um, excavating silenced voices and marginalized identities and rehabilitating them at the center. And it was becoming a kind of routine and tortuous exercise of doing this again and again. And this fits perfectly with you know, our, our neoliberal multicultural society where identities become very important. So they're, they're, I, I, the way I characterize in the book, it's almost like a competition for tragedy. Who can find the more marginalized subject? Who is most marginalized? And it produces an endless array of competing identities, each claiming that I should be, I am the most marginalized. My history has not been told, so I should be at the center. I think post-colonial can do better by moving away from this politics of symbolic identities and looking at um, those things that remain unaddressed in both our analysis as well as the discourses that have shaped the colonial and post-colonial mindsets. And this is where I think, you know, um, the, the divorce between post-colonial theory and psychoanalysis, which happened, I guess, sometimes in the eight, late 80s, is unfortunate because uh, there is a lot that post-colonial uh, studies can take from psychoanalysis and a lot that they can contribute in making psychoanalysis more global. I mean, the, the most obvious thing, of course, which would benefit post-colonial studies is the notion of identities as fictive, fictitious, misrecognized. I mean, we say that in post-colonial studies, but if we have that theoretical connection, I think it becomes much more important, much more useful. Uh, we talk about othering. The moment we misrecognize an identity, we have to establish that identity as uh, better than the other. So West better than East, light better than dark. Um, and then we go on to construct the other. Uh, and it's important that we look at how this construction is happening, but I think it's also equally important, and this is where post-colonial can benefit by having a dialogue with psychoanalysis, if we look at how in the process of othering or even after othering, there are some lingering interruptions, impediments that continue to, you know, discombobulate, discomb, uh, what's the word, discombobulate uh, our, our processes of othering, right? So basically as Lacan teaches us, the real remains no matter what, those impediments would remain in the path. So, no form of othering becomes absolute, total, and effective. Just like no essential identity can ever exist. So these are very two simple things that are used uh, a lot in post-colonial studies, which I think can find a, a, a very good uh, connection to, to psychoanalysis, especially the way psychoanalysis um, talks about subjectivity. Yeah, that's a really good point. And um, I'm glad you explained that because when you were saying like what the, each field felt about the other, you said like psychoanalysis is like, oh, with the identity politics. And I definitely want everybody to like have their voice and their place and everything like that. Absolutely. Um, but when, when you said that, it made me realize also like in psychoanalysis, like as a practice, I feel like so much of the practice is like trying to help people like get out of all these identities that ha people have 
placed upon them, like what they should be or what they should do with their lives and try to figure out like what what's underneath that, what really, really is their desire, you know? Um, so yeah, that just came to mind with the, with the whole like trying to like hold on to identity and identity may not always be health, healthy for an individual, but of course it's important to have identity uh, in a more political realm when people are fighting for their rights. Yes, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I try uh, uh, or I would want to clear up here is that I am not against, you know, uh, right-based politics and movements towards guaranteeing rights to everyone. Absolutely. I mean, that, that is on one side. But what I'm also saying is that instead of remaining caught in one thought capsule, can we imagine other ways of thinking about identity, marginalization of certain social subjects, the politics involved in returning them into society? What are the other ways of doing that? And I, one reason why I wanted to address this in the book is because I thought at least as an academic practice, post-colonial studies, again, not entirety of it, but at least majority of it has got stuck in that, you know, cycle of uh, retrieving, the politics of retrieving and setting up otherwise marginalized identities. But talking about how identity is important, but how we also need to be able to traverse the misrecognized identities, uh, we, at least I, where I am in my current work, I come to Franz Fanon. Because that is, and Fanon obviously was an analyst, he worked in the clinics and he um, uh, was very much kind of, you know, doing the kind of work that you just described that you have to also do. But if we look at his early work, Black Skin, White Masks, I think, he is making a very, very interesting point, which is for the black man or the colonized, there is no real identity. Because as Fanon says, the black man is caught between the desire to be white, which he can never be, and remaining black, an identity which does not exist. So for the black man in black skin, white masks, what exists or the way he or she exists is between these two equally fictitious, but claim to be essential identities. And he has two separate chapters, one looking at the black man, the other looking at the black woman, where it explores the extent to which the colonized subject is trying to become white because that's the center, that's where the glory and wealth lies and how that cannot happen. Because as Fanon himself writes in the book uh, and as he was to realize once he was in France, he was just a black man. Um, and he gives this anecdotes, his experiences of uh, being identified as such. And he says, in the eyes of these people, I am just a barbarian, you know, uh, nothing more. Even though the promise of French colonization was assimilation. If you speak French, if you know the French literature and culture, then you are one of us, which is kind of different from British colonization, which is, as I said before, will create one small group of men who would be English in taste and culture, but Indian by blood and color. Again, very different from Belgian, which was basically complete oppression and exploitation. And once that is done, just get rid of them. Heart of darkness or Belgian Congo, what happened there? And Fano realized that's never going to happen. And Fano's experience is also shared by a number of Indians who benefited from English education, 
who thought, therefore, that they are English, they did not just pick up the language, they picked up the culture, like what clothes to wear, what to eat, how to eat. Yet they were never, when they went to England, treated as anything other than the Indian. But what does it mean to be Indian? Or what does it mean to be black is exactly what Fano is saying, because there is no essential identity that is black. So I think that, that's something which um, I'm also kind of working on right now, working through the writings of Fano, um, because he addresses this uh, topic of identity. And honestly speaking, you know, I mean, can we really have an existence without identity? Or uh, can we exist outside of the symbolic order? Uh, that, that would become very difficult. Uh, that would be a kind of steering into the nothingness that would be too traumatic for, 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 for a subject. Uh, because, uh, for example, someone like me, uh, I'm an expat in the United States. I've been in this country for about 18 or 19 years. I'm not a citizen. I don't know if I'm going to um, become a citizen anytime soon, but my son is. Uh, I think identity does play an important role from time to time, because at one level, uh, it's almost embodied. Um, so I do get identified as an Indian. Uh, and alongside, I also get identified, uh, if I'm an Indian, then I must be in uh, IT, so which I, unfortunately I'm not. Um, so there, so I think identity cuts both ways. Right? Um, the way I as an Indian have an identity in the United States, um, where I think we can be considered some kind of a model minority of sorts, is very different from the way I as an Indian would have an identity in let's say England where uh, Indians are both in blue and white collar professions. Uh, so those, those things, things would change, but I think it's a very important and interesting um, aspect that, that post-colonial studies must take up, at least I'm trying to take up, um, thinking about what identity means and how identities are constructed and currently I'm really interested in, in, in looking at how, what, what Fano is thinking about this identity. And if he's basically claiming the impossibility of identity between desiring to be white and remaining black, what does that mean? And where does it uh, place the colonizer, the black man in terms of freedom or emancipation from the colonial regime? And that seems like a good segue to the piece that you wrote for Sheldon George and Derek Hook's new book on Lacan and race. Should we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, sure it is. Um, in, in fact, I was actually, um, the, the funnel of a bit that I was sharing uh, appears in that, in that essay. Um, unfortunately, I'm still to get the copy of the book. The publishers have sent it. So I'm still to see the final version, but, uh, uh, that's exactly what I'm saying in that piece uh, that Fano in Black Skin, White Masks is introducing this very uh, important problem uh, that we need to focus on, especially in the current climate of Black Lives Matters, as well as the different kinds of race-based oppressions happening all across the world, or identity-based oppressions that are happening across the world. Um, and what I find fascinating in Fano is apart from saying that the colonized falls in this gap or interstice between whiteness desiring whiteness and remaining black. Fano says very early on in Black Skin, White Mask, in fact, I start that essay with that, 
passage, it's a very short passage. It's a very poetic and cryptic passage. Uh, Fano says, this is the zone of non-being. I'm paraphrasing, a sterile and arid region. But he says, if the black man could only take advantage of this zone of non-being, some new possibilities can emerge. Fano is not only, uh, and this is, this is in the introduction of the book, not only talking about the fact that the colonized falls in this gap between the two uh, essentially false identities, but the interesting thing is the colonizer, the black man, does not realize that, is, is not conscious about that. So he or she continues performing one identity or the other, or one identity against the other. Uh, and he goes into discussion in his chapters about um, how or what those performances are and how they result in nothing. Instead, he appears to suggest that if the colonizer, the black man, is to grow conscious of his or her essential negativity, because he or she occupies a space between two identities, a space that cannot be symbolized, or in otherwise, a subject under a colonial regime is essentially not just a negated subject, that is the subject is not white, the subject is not uh, enlightened, the subject is not European, the othering of the subject. It's not simply negated, but it inhabits a space of radical negativity and it is actually a deontologized existence of non-being. Because the way the othering happens by negating it from the identity of the self, that othering is, or the identity that comes with that othering is not only false, but in most cases, it's, it's completely without any evidence. So you really cannot base your identity on that. And that is why Fano uh, is, is very against the kind of revivalism that we often see in colonized subjects and also in post-colonial societies about returning to the pre-colonial golden past. It was all good then, we must go back there. Um, you know, if I give the example of India or South Asia, um, the British imperial historians like Mill divided South Asian history into three parts. The Hindu or the Aryan part, followed by the Muslim part, followed by the British. The idea was, and this Mill's idea, the tripartite division of South Asian history comes from Hegel. The idea being there was history or the spirit of history was during the rule of the Hindus. Then because of a Muslim invasion and interruption, history has traveled back to Europe. It hasn't touched Africa, as Hegel said. And then the British rule is there to rescue the lost golden Hindu past from the appetitive rule of the Muslim interregnum. So apart from drawing from Hegel's notion of how history has moved a spirit of history, this is also part and parcel of the British colonial operation to divide countries on basis of religion, race, caste, and all sorts of things. Now, what we are witnessing in present day globalized India is this hankering for a pre-Muslim golden past failing to realize that is the colonial construction. Nothing like that existed. And at the same time, a determination of Muslims, including Indian citizens who are Muslims, as the remnants of that enemy 
who made us lose the Hindu past. So Fanu obviously does not talk about uh, India, but he makes a very clear point that these revivalist kind of tendencies doesn't help. I think he, and I write about this in the chapter two, I think at one point he says, it would be delightful to find a black philosopher who corresponded with Plato. It would be delightful to find an uh, African prophet who was teaching at the same time as historical Jesus. But none of these is going to change the condition of a farmer who is toiling away in the sugar canes of Guadalupe. The other thing which I find very useful for me, especially in the context of my book and my interest in bringing postcolonial studies in dialogue with psychoanalysis, is the way Fanon, by focusing on the subject, on the question of ontology, gives us an opportunity to move beyond examining colonialism only in terms of power and oppression, move away from that and also think of colonialism in relation to ontology. What is the ontological condition of the colonized? And this in my understanding, as I've tried to argue in that chapter, and hopefully in the project that I am hoping to complete, marks a radical shift from the general tendency in post-colonial studies uh, to talk only in terms of power and how power oppresses one social group versus another social group and what can be done to, you know, return marginalized groups to the center of power. I think Fano makes a radical departure by even saying that not only is the colonized ontologically uh, affected by colonialism, so is the white man, so is the colonizer. And I personally see resonances with that argument in the writings of someone like George Orwell or someone like E.M. Forster, uh, who when talking about the colonies are also talking about the way the colonizer is impacted by trying to perform his or her role as the master. So yeah, that, uh, without uh, giving out too much since I guess the book is just coming out and I don't know how Sheldon and Derek might, might find it, but that is what I'm trying to do. It's, 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 it's a kind of a theoretical piece. It has a lot of uh, open ends, loose ends, uh, but uh, it's, it's a work in progress uh, as I'm also kind of working with and through Fano and my, my archive is not Fano's archive, uh, uh, my archive of uh, South Asian literature and British literature and trying to see how I can uh, build a, build a uh, weave uh, with Fano, with post-colonial studies, with psychoanalysis, with my archive, um, in order to illustrate more the kind of radical departures or radical insights contained in Fano. Um, you know, Fano, uh, in, in my first book, I, I actually said that, you know, uh, if you're talking about post-colonial studies, there are three big names, post-colonial theories, Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak, and Homi Bhabha. Uh, they, as I said, Robert Young has uh, termed them the Holy Trinity. And I have said that we need a plus one. And that plus one is Fano. You know, it's, it's very important that we bring Fano in the mix if we have to rejuvenate post-colonial studies, if you have to save it from, you know, becoming kind of routine exercise and making make it relevant for our global present. Yeah, and somehow, like, like you said, like sometimes places decolonize, but then maintain a lot of similar characteristics. And that's what I worry about with people kind of putting themselves in identity boxes too much is like those identities for me feel like they're part of this like system that we're trying to like break away from. And you don't want to keep using their their lens, like this like white cis hetero patriarchal lens to view everyone. And how do we change the discourse? Um, I mean, it's going to take a long time, but like, how can we eventually change the discourse um, 
to make it something new. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, that's exactly what is missing in current academic and scholarly and intellectual discussions, this need to have more provocative thinking and big thinking, thinking about big stuff. You know, there's been too much, um, you know, focus on action and uh, signing this uh, change.org petition and doing this rally. I think we have to also think and knew about what is to be done. Because as you rightly said, I mean, a uh, lot of post-colonial societies today are actually mimicking the state machinery of the colonial regime. Similarly, a lot of societies across the world actually who moved away from fascism and totalitarianism and embraced democracy are now more and more kind of becoming uh, neo-fascist states. And it's, as I said, it's happening all across the world. So I think more than ever, it's, it's the need of the hour is to be able to start thinking about some of those issues which we had thought to have been resolved already. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Gautam Basu Thakur. For more, check out his books, Postcolonial Lack, Identity, Culture, Surplus, Reading Lacan Seminar 8 on Transference, Postcolonial Theory and Avatar, and Lacan and the Non-Human. As well, check out his chapter in the book Lacan and Race, edited by Sheldon George and Derek Hook. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. You can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org, for links and more information. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. You can support the podcast at our Patreon patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. That's V-A-N-E-S-S-A 23 C-A-R-L. Your support is very appreciated. Thank you so much for supporting Rendering Unconscious Podcast and all of my other creative endeavors. And now the song Situated in the Gap dedicated to Derek Jarman from the brand new album This is Voyeurism a collaboration between myself and Pete Murphy available from Highbrow Low Life just go to highbrowlowlife.bandcamp.com The soundtrack a fitting exploration of cut up sound collage techniques providing an ethereal soundscape. Sexuality is fluid. Sexuality and death. I...
Matador, voyeurism, exhibitionism, drugs, alcohol, sex, music, freedom, poetry, life, chaos, journey, trials, film, silence, struggle, within the creative process, create universes of your own, within the creative process, create universes of your own within the creative process create universes of your own